Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. Have you ever thought, wouldn't it be nice to just buy an old European castle, maybe talk my friends into moving in with me, then try to take over the world? Well, have we got a book for you today. We are going to talk about castles and covenants on Tomes of Magic today. But before we get into it, I thought we might open things up for announcements. And you know, I actually have one myself today. In past episodes, I recommended books as visual aids to help storytellers with ideas for their games. I have two more today that were written for fantasy RPGs. Trilemma Adventures came out in 2019. It is full of isometric illustrations of interesting places. The images give a very good 3D sense of the places and can be shown to your players if you have trouble describing them. There are suggestions without game rules of interesting things to put in these locations to threaten or tempt your players. The Steeps of the Erming makes an excellent network of caves you could place beneath a city sewer or Doisetep Chantry. The Unmended Ways is two lofty peaks with a rope bridge between them. Caves are carved into the peaks. I would make use of this as a place for seekings. Eventually, the player discovers it's a spot in the Umbra others visit. Why is his avatar leading him there? Lenses of Heaven make a great chantry for hermetics in Sorcerer's Crusade or a Horizon Realm in Mage. Cleft of Five Worlds is begging to be an umbral realm and suggests secrets to discover there. The second book was just released. The Wanderer's Guide is 27 large color high resolution illustrations of fantastic places. They are isometric with cutaways making them very useful for play. Showing them to your player saves time describing the scene, but the real use is giving you ideas for interesting places. The images of towns and the insides of their buildings are ready as is for Sorcerer's Crusade and would work well for Horizon Chantry, the headquarters of the traditions in Mage. The Wizard Towers are great for Sanctums. The underground and magic fortress scenes would be Umbral locations. Uh, if you want to check that out, I'll put some links in the show notes. But uh, Terry, did you have any announcements? I think it's interesting that that is available through DriveThruRPG. So if you grab it through them, you will be supporting us. Thank you. At some point, we went from the 5% commission to the 8% commission level. And I'm like, oh, we've made it. It's interesting that it's available in both PDF and print on demand, which is kind of cool. And it looks like a bunch of their other publications, they've had it done for a bunch of different systems. So their, their bestiary it looks like they put out an edition of it for the Year Zero engine, which Mutant Year Zero uses, the Basic and Expert edition for Dungeon World. If you really want to be like, I need more bad guys for my Powered by the Apocalypse dungeon setting. And I'm like, huh, nice work, Trilemma. Yeah, that's their name. So, no, I don't have anything else to add. Well, great. Uh, let's uh, kick it off today talking about Castles and Covenants. Uh, this book came out in 1998. That's still the year that the Sorcerer's Crusade core book came out. It clocks in at 132 pages. There were four people contributing to this. Um, Aldith Beltane, Eric Griffin, Phil Master, and I believe it's Cian Kingstone. I, I might be wrong in the pronunciation there. I hope you'll forgive me. But uh, this book gets us into the uh, Covenants, which is basically chantries of the Sorcerer's Crusade era, talks about their locations, what's going on there. Uh, Terry, could you start us with a walkthrough? I will be glad to. My first note is that if you have the PDF copy of this that you got legitimately through DriveThruRPG, this is a DTRPG special where it looks like they found someone who had already scanned it and shared it on like BitTorrent in 2004. The entire thing looks vaguely purple, like they stole a mimeograph copy of it ahead of time. And a lot of the pencil drawings are quality Laubenstein art things where everyone looks like a dwarf with a skin condition. And normally these things combined would make me absolutely terrified. And then I cracked open the opening fiction and it involves two women with a psychic connection, a wolf with a psychic connection, and people in a realm with a psychic connection. And I'm like, holy dink, what have I gotten myself in for? And I was very glad to find out that appearances can be deceiving because this book was was an absolute hoot. But the opening fiction involves the lady from Bygone Bestiary that helps someone return a unicorn need help from the lady that helped her return the unicorn. One of the recurring themes that we find out in Sorcerer's Crusade is that everything is constantly having the heat sucked out of it in the Sorcerer's Crusade era, and that is always the phrase that they use. And I'm like, oh man, this is coming up again. But one of the characters finds themselves in a realm that is tied to the element of water. It is cold and it is wet. I don't know why the element of water is never like kind of a, a warm wetness, like maybe something like more of a spa environment, but maybe we will investigate 
investigate that as a separate supplement. Mary runs as a wolf. Kestrel pisses off some umbral lady. Mary is in wolf form, attacks Kestrel, and nothing involving castles or covenants occurs at all by my reckoning. But it was perfectly fine. I mean, it wasn't too long. The writing was okay. Uh, this was a Shane Kingstone bit. And then and then the rest of the book starts uh, with, with a woodcut. <laughs> so yeah, w- w- woodcuts. Did you have any thoughts on the opening on the opening fiction? The opening fiction was interesting for me because it does have a castle, but it's populated by Umbrood. It's in an Umbrood realm. It's a place where humans visit like one at a time. They make very short stays. So it doesn't really count as the kind of castle this book is about. It really had nothing at all to do with covenants. Yeah. But um, it's not a total write-off because it has a really good example of a Renaissance era seeking based on the four elements. In this seeking, it explains that fire is action, air is thought, water is instinct. It doesn't tell us what earth is. But but still, this is a very interesting look at a seeking based on the four elements. And suppose any storyteller could give an, a given element a different uh, meaning. It, it seems to imply that the element associated with the uh, avatar of the mage is the the top of the four and they have to like work up to it through successive seekings i think that's that's where they're trying to go with this but certainly an interesting look at that so it's it's an interesting fiction for uh, storytellers who are running sorcerer's crusade just don't expect it to have anything to do with what the book is about (laughs) I also like the utter lack of reverence that is sometimes done for write-ups in this era of people interacting with their avatars, where there's the umbrood lady who's like, have you discerned the reason why you are here? And the mage is like, if you don't shut up immediately, I will slap the living heck out of you. (laughs) And the lady's like, I will take that as a no. You don't get to do magic anymore. And the mage is like, damn it. Who could have told me that completely gainsaying the person with omniscient power and omnipotent abilities in this realm could have resulted in consequences? Crap. So I very much appreciated that because that that feels very, very mage to me. (laughs) When you're in the throne room standing in front of the king, you have to be nice to him? No. (laughs) Consequences. That word hasn't been invented along with with entropy. Things that are not period appropriate. The, the, The next section, interestingly, is not the introduction, but chapter one, souls and mortar. Chapter one just kind of runs through backgrounds for all cabals and covenants. Uh, Cabal term for a collection of mages. They may go by a number of different terms. Uh, Covenants are made up of cabals. They are the places themselves. They will have at least one. They come in a number of basic forms. You have the castle household model, the college, the trade house, or the monastery. Monasteries kind of act as a store of knowledge, and at the best times, they share it. They tend to be just one sex. And I like the idea that the whole idea was a monastery is kind of a human vault of understanding because even by the Middle Ages, there have been a couple of cycles of things are great, things are not so great. How do we protect things during the not so great times? And I, I appreciated that even that long view of history. Castles are kind of the personal household of a noble, that they rule the surrounding community, that they wage war when necessary. The hierarchy is absolute. Colleges are a collection of st- scholars, and they tend towards a more democratic system. They tend to solve issues by voting. A trade house is very much like a castle. You start trading with personal funds before introduced, being introduced to the funds of the house. Different covenants will have different functions. A war covenant exists to do violence. It may be temporary or enduring. A college covenant wishes to study and teach magic. Few are full-scale universities. They are often listed as student houses within a city and they need to hide their nature. The hermetics and the celestial masters tend to be the most common operators of this type of a covenant. You have exploration covenants that are a base for explorers. They're a home port and a source of finance. They're a place to which materials can be picked up and gossip and exotic goods can be returned. Order of Reason runs most of these, but the Chakravanti, the Hermetics, Dream Speakers, and Seers of Kronos do it as well. And then I like that they list that they're ancient sh- uh, chantries, and you're like, the function of these is to exist because they're very old. And you're like, okay, well, unless you're being honest. Many traditions have them. They tend to pick up a collection of permanent and temporary temporary goals based on the personalities of the inhabitants, the Akashics, the Batini, and the Hermetics are are known to have these, and they tend to be one tradition. Uh, Hereditary covenants are family groups. They 
verbena and the Chakravanti being the most common. Then we have the idea of the vagrant covenant with no adept present or no regular quintessence source. They tend to have to raid Cray and are viewed as being useful pawns. They mention that Crays are terribly useful, but they frequently come with a shallowing, a, a thin area to the umbro, which can also be a hazard unto itself. It also mentions that there are some uh, covenants that exist in Horizon. Most are just in the common world. A few are other places like Horizon and Duizitap. Lists is being very hard to make and requiring mastery and great quintessence. Realms and their inhabitants tend to influence each other. Covenants can be formed for a number of reasons, found to leverage a cray, so an area of great magical potence is, is discovered and people are like, right? We should put a covenant here. And then they get about to uh, put a covenant there. Getting everyone to cooperate requires protocols for everyone to agree on. They may incorporate other documents like the Compact of uh, Callias for a multi-traditional chantry. And then we get a bit on architecture, that the style follows the group making it up. And one of the interesting things here was they talk about Dedalian architecture, which tends to harken forward or back, that they tend to look back to um, uh, to more Greco-Roman styles, that they may follow Masonic or sacred architecture or some sort of scientific geometry, or they will follow much older forms of some sort of golden age that they are harkening back to. Stone is still the most common material, and it is fortified frequently with magic. Uh, styles and fortifications are regulated in many areas because your uh, local noble is not interested in uh, seeing your your castle being too uh, defensible. Uh, hilltop sites are pretty common. Towers provide the most defense. Turrets are slowly replacing arrow slits. Uh, brick is coming into popularity. It talks a little bit about international variations where Islamic areas tend to feature domes and warm areas tend to have more courtyards. Privacy is now seen as a mark of sophistication. So rather than having a great hall be the uh, sole feature where all of your goods can be seen in common, the idea of having a withdrawing room or a private area to the household is considered a sign of wealth and power. Uh, constructing one of these sites is going to take eight to 10 years, and it is hard to speed this up without it being suspicious. Other technologies that may come into to play is uh, uh, concrete, which may have been stored in some areas as in the secret to create it. And the, the famed ivory towers of the Order of Reason may just be a particular type of concrete. A large portion of those presents at a covenant are there just to kind of maintain it. The next section gets into covenant folk, the people that will help maintain a household. Most covenant activities involve situ simply perpetuating the covenant. People together form a household or familia. Generosity is important. The order of reason tends to be a little more equitable in how it treats its staff and such. Mages are often in charge and lords are expected to lead the hunt or to make something useful to keep the covenant going. They are in charge of dispensing justice and providing defense. Most members of a covenant are going to be servants of some form and Everyone has a, uh, anyone of note has servants. Even a lowly esquire would generally have seven attendants of some sort. Houses need to be tightly run. The steward and the chamberlain are kind of the commanders. One oversees all of the activities of the household, where the other one will see all of the, oversee the house itself and the goods it contains. The gentry are going to be right below the lord. They serve, but they are not considered to be gross inferiors. The seneschal is in charge of getting stuff, and the chamberlain operates the household itself. The constable will be securing the area. Next is kind of the butler and treasurer and then pages. Uh, these tend to be ranks where more women are present. It notes that guards are relatively rare as having guards tends to make people suspicious. A house in most cases needs to be self-sufficient and it is even possible for covenants located within realms to have large sleeper populations. And it makes mention of the fact that at this point Horizon has one to two thousand sleepers present and in the modern eras will have ten times as much. It finally goes through the season system. This is something that Mage has talked about previously and is also something that it ported in from Ars Magica that a covenant generally starts in spring. They knew they're new. They make mistakes. They make war. War and vagrant covenants tend to fall here, tend to be here. In summer, they are growing, but slowly very active, but not fully respected. In autumn, you are strong, but less ambitious. This period can last centuries. Winter represents cold death. Winter is possibly capable of turning into a fine spring. The order of reason almost en masse is moving from spring to summer. The last little bit we get is information on kind of maintaining good contact with the neighbors, that uh, people are nosy and do very little travel 
travel, so they tend to be all up in each other's business. Town covenants will very much have neighbors, and it is important to be on good terms with them. Likewise, in a rural area, you want to be on good terms with your surrounding villages. Awakened foes may always be present, from vampires to Dedalians leading peasants' revolts and letting them eh, borrow one or two things of note. Basically, the section is on how even the best defended of covenants can still face harm and threat. This was a good collection of useful background information. I don't feel in many cases that it wasted my time. It gave us constant reminders of what the society of the era looked like. I would have liked a little bit more information about organizational tactics outside of kind of Europe, but uh, that seems to be a constant refrain throughout most of Sorcerer's Crusade. So what did you think of chapter one, Adam? I think this chapter was really well written. Uh, hats off to the author. Uh, good writing and awareness of previous mage material, uh, intelligent observations, and a good understanding of the differences between mages and sleepers. That's something I always like to see and, and really saw it here. They talk about the forms of covenants. That was very well done. It was suited to the area, uh, flexible and well explained. Uh, there's also the functions of covenants, and I thought those mapped uh, very well to the chantries in in book, you know, types of chantries in, in Book of Chantries. So it was it was nice to see that uh, well adapted to the period and it certainly made sense. I really liked the section on the interior of period buildings. That really helped me to understand as a storyteller how to portray when the players visit different sorts of, of places in, in Renaissance Europe and what they might look like and uh, some details of, of defending them. Uh, for example, there are a number of towers, which in those days are not, you know, uh, 100 stories tall, but uh, more like four or five stories tall, perhaps. But uh, a lot of towers have no door on the ground floor. They would have stairs that go up to the second floor. And that's the only way to walk into the building, and unless you're blowing holes in the wall. And with thick stone walls, that, that's a consideration. So these stairs are easier to defend and easier to notice. And, and so, you know, details like that really helped me as a storyteller. So I, I appreciated what the author was doing for me there. Um, there's a section of Covenant Folk. And it talks about, in this section, it talks about how the order of reason covenants uh, usually, on average, function better than tradition covenants because they treat their uh, employees better uh, just because of the, the notions of the order of reason, their, their thoughts on equality and, and, and so forth. And so I thought that was, that was interesting to notice and can help explain how the uh, Daedalians became more and more powerful and influential as time went on. Uh, I, I like the idea that mages with time uh, will realize that covenants will help them achieve their goals, and so they invest the uh, effort and time into starting and, and growing uh, their covenants or joining a successful one. And this chapter uh, does a good job of explaining that if a mage does not delegate responsibilities, then uh, they don't have a lot of staff to worry about, but they have to do so much stuff themselves that they're going to have very little time to do the things that they're in the covenant to do. But as they hire more and more employees, they are responsible for more and more people. They have to keep them happy. Also, those are more potential problems as enemies try to turn hirelings against the leaders of a covenant to uh, try and cause infiltration or destruction there. So uh, very nice how it uh, calls that out to a storyteller, helps us understand what, how we might use that in our games. So that is why I say this, this chapter helps equip me better to be a storyteller for this Renaissance era. Again, I'm not crazy about the Four Seasons model of, of covenants they talk about here, and there's two reasons why I'm, I'm not excited about it. One is everybody automatically assumes the season that's going to come next. Well, summer comes after spring. But because of what's happening in your government, you might shoot from spring to winter or autumn or something like that. I think it's good for everyone to help keep that in mind. Also, a covenant might display aspects of more than one season at a time. So I, as a storyteller, I, I don't lean too heavily on the four seasons metaphor. But uh, anyways, uh, on to chapter two. That is... Uh, Covenants of the Order of Reason, uh, thought I might help with the walkthrough on this one. The White Tower of Languedoc is located at the top of a hill in southern France. It is the headquarters of the Order of Reason. We read in past mage books that the Order of Reason seized the tower from Yuasmi, a hermetic mage. That was the old headquarters in northern France. The Sorcerer's Crusade core book tells us that is now called the White Tower of Yuasmi. Personally, I think the Order of Reason would rename it. Anyways, sleepers were stirring up trouble in the region with their petty wars. So in 1492, the Order built a new White Tower of Languedoc farther south, and that's the one we have in this chapter. Each convention of the order is well represented here uh, with both members and resources. There are eight halls. Uh, each hall is a, a large building that is well protected uh, towards the center of the covenant. 
That is one for each convention in the order of reason, plus an extra empty one. The empty hall is not used for secret meetings of the Kasira Phi at night because that's impossible. The Kasira Phi do not exist. Okay, just setting that straight. The Order of Reason stores many resources here, and the Covenant is a center of activity. Rowan Castle is in western England, near the border of Wales. It is primarily a military fortress that houses Gabrielite knights and artificers. It was the headquarters of Wingard's March, a reign of terror that swept the British Isles and did much to anger pagan mages. Wingard is no more, but his legacy of militancy is still present here. The castle is located near several important roads, and it is from here that the Order sends troops out to enforce its will on the region. Two spies for the traditions are living there and passing themselves off as Daedalians. I think it's time to fire the head of security. The Palazzo Theorini is a wealthy family's home in Venice on the Italian peninsula. It is the headquarters of the Theorini family, who are members of the Order of Reason's High Guild. This covenant is not the center of the High Guild's activity in Venice. Venice is such an important city to the High Guild that they have multiple covenants there, including the Locus Presidii. The Palazzo is not a large covenant, but well-stocked, well-defended, and very well-decorated. If you get an invitation to stay there, by all means take it. Just don't get caught sneaking around in the middle of the night. It wouldn't end well. The Theorini family is so interested in maritime trade and exploration that they have opened their home to a number of void seekers that can often be found residing there. Brandenburg Krakenhaus is located in what is today Germany. It is a Kosian covenant that started in 1376, but their main building is a castle constructed in the 1100s. The Covenant's buildings are quite old and in poor repair. The Covenant does not have much power or influence, but it is a center of activity. Kosians holding different beliefs about medicine have come together to make this a place of healing, education, and research. A tent city of ill and injured peasants has grown up around the Covenant and visit daily looking for cures. Some of them are whisked to the dungeons beneath the castle where frightening operations occur, some of which are even helpful. Portus Crucis is a fantastical collection of impossibly tall and thin towers built on Mount Crucis. This mountain is well hidden and very difficult to reach by conventional methods. The write-up isn't clear about its location, but hints it is in Portugal or Spain. Precarious planks, scaffolds, and other construction link the towers and allow the sky riggers of the Order of Reason to dock here. Sky riggers are built and tested here. They also recruit sailors, unload their cargoes, and use the markets for trade. This location is kept secret from sleepers, so the Order of Reason openly displays many of their wonders. The markets sell common items as well as wondrous things collected in the realms that only sky riggers can visit. Well, that's a rundown of the five covenants in this chapter, and this chapter really is just those five covenants. There's there's no further material. Uh, so, Terry, what did you think of chapter two? This was fascinating. The White Tower is listed as being both Albigensian and on a neutral cray. I don't know what a neutral cray is, but I'm terribly curious now. It makes mention that you could not take down the via silicos network by just destroying the via silicos here. It also mentions that in some cases there are multiple of them, and I'm curious if this is just the equivalent of having like a two-line phone where you're like, oh, the Caserify are hogging the via silicos. You're allowed to use the other one in the guest room, but that one doesn't have as good a sound quality. It's okay. You just have to make sure that the windows are closed or something like that and there's also like father yakov is listed here who has the sobriquet of the bloodthirsty dove and uh, i spent a non-trivial portion of a car ride while reading this trying to come up with a father yakov yakov smirnov style joke to go with this and the closest i could get is at the white tower reason orders you balloons are listed as likely to call down the scourge which implies to me that they are too powerful to exist in mundane reality it also kind of brings up the idea that the best defense is having a community that likes you so they try and be nice to everyone in the area so that was that was pretty cool there were a lot of references to both Wingard's march as well as the decade of the hunt which is kind of the counteroffensive that the traditions or at least the local pagan groups do in this area and i was not sure what they were talking about at first and it took me a little bit to uh to pick up with that. Castle Rowan is indicated as having wall hangings depicting famous moments in order of reason history, which means at some point someone had to commission a tapestry that said, right, show a bunch of people in really cool armor beating the piss out of a wizard. That's good work there you're doing, Marty. 
keep it up. The Palazzo, I absolutely loved. They mentioned that there could be a literal secret at the foundation of the place, and I like when a game book is very explicit as to what the things are that they are not going to answer for you, where they're just like, yep, there's a thing here, go nuts with it. I also like that it tells you what the seasons are going to look like for this group in all likelihood, so it allows you to say, hey, I want the Palazzo to fill this role in my game. I'm going to roll it forward or roll it backward to this season. The Brandenburg Kraken House, which I kept reading, seeing as the reading is the Brandenburg crack house. Holy shit. This place has a long backstory to it. The art on page 58 is amazing as it just kind of shows this sea of tents. Adam, did you get the impression that when it talked about how people got in and out, that it literally involved people with horse carts, drag racing on top of tents in a moat? Like it, <laughs> it talked about them crashing from the top of stall to the top of stall. Like, I think they're drag racing horses on top of a moat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was there was an impression about that. That was that was a fun little addition. Yeah. Uh, Portus Crucis, I like the idea of the Rotarios. These are the set of things required to complete a voyage, and it is the rote for a trip. Indicates that there are a lot of rats, that they are generally, that they are dealt with with cats. Uh, Terry's annoying note, rats are generally poorly dealt with with cats. You usually use dogs for that. Uh, cats can take on mice. Rats will comfortably eat a cat in insufficient quantity. It feels like one of those places that is sufficiently out of the way to function as kind of a horizon realm, even though it's on the mundane side of the gauntlet. It also makes it note that boats can sail into the Umbra, which makes sense as shallowings can probably exist on the ocean. And as they are unexplored, you can just kind of find yourself in weird places. And I like that as an idea of fantastic stories told by sailors that at times maybe they fell into a regio or a shallowing or something, not realizing it. There was a long section on sky riggers, which was pretty fascinating. I'm still not sure how they work. It kind of indicated that the way they do it is that they have three parts of them that are comically large and made out of silver. And silver has an agreement that it can cut through the elements. And I'm like, oh, this is the kind and level of silent science we are using, which if true, I now need vastly more information on how the order of reason works, which hopefully we will get in the order of reason book. It talks about how void ships are filled with void stuff, which makes sense. We also get information about ghost ships and that is awesome. We also get the nail ritual where everyone who participates, who could participate in the creation of a ship, throws their nail into a bucket. One is drawn, and that is the first nail that goes into creating the ship, and that shipwright is now tied to the destiny of the vessel. This section really fleshes out the characters of the Order of Reason. Each thinks that they are carrying science, belief, or faith in some way, and it really makes the Order of Reason feel like somewhere between like the Jesuits and and any number of other learned societies in varying degrees of religiosity. I really want information at this point about what the wards for the Order of Reason look like. Yeah, uh, and I also like the fact that the Verbena are described as a carbuncle upon England. And I'm like, yeah, take that. Uh, we now have vastly more information about what the Order of Reason is doing in the era, and I liked almost all of it. Uh, if anything, I wish there were more. I want to know what the magic looks like. I need more information on how Sky Riggers work, and I hope we get those in few future publications. Uh, did you have any more uh, thoughts on Chapter 2? I agree that this was a, a very good chapter. There's a lot of good material here. The illustrations for buildings I thought was great. All five of the locations have one illustration showing the building, you know, from a bit of a distance uh, out, outside of the building. And I, I thought they were great. They don't all totally match the uh, typed up descriptions, but they're certainly close enough and uh, they're very evocative. They, these illustrations really helped me kind of get a like a, what is it, gut reaction to seeing the place. And that can help me uh, not only describe it to my players, but motivate me to include it in my game. So great job on that. Let's see, when it was talking about Rowan Castle, it talks about uh, there is a Verbena mage there who makes sure that she never has any quintessence in her, her body, her personal pattern, and that helps her to pass herself off as a sleeper when other mages are looking for. And uh, I, I thought that was cool. It backs up an idea I've, I've always had as a mage storyteller. That is, um, I, I tell my players, look, if you're trying to pass yourself as off as a sleeper uh, against mages, you know, NPC mages you don't know very well, make sure there's no quintessence in you, because otherwise they can tell. And so that, that was something I always had my, my players aware of, especially those who had any dots in the prime sphere. 
Uh, so it's nice to be backed up there. The Theorini family that lives in Venice and works for the High Guild, they have a long-standing family tradition of hunting down vampires. And it's one of those details that it's it's not necessary. It doesn't define them as a group or define how a storyteller presents that covenant. But I just thought it, it was so interesting. It, it seemed reasonable to me, and it made this more fun. So if I was going to use the Theorini family in my games, that, that vampire hunting element is there. There's probably some older vampires in Venice that are really upset with them that are hiring the players to go against them or, or something like that. Just suggest possibilities. A lot of fun. The Kraken, uh, let's see, Brandenburg Kraken House in, in what is today Germany, uh, that write-up had some really good uh, paradigm information for one of the groups of Kosians. And I'm, I'm not going to belabor the point here, but it basically helps you to understand how the um, biology and medicine, uh, the the cutting edge of that knowledge back in the you know early 1500s, late 1400s was quite different from the way it is today, but it, it kind of explains a, a basic overall approach to that and how mages might you know build sphere effects on top of that. So I appreciated it. The Order of Reason over at Port Crucis is making fake flying ghost ships. I thought that was just awesome. Uh, flashbacks to old Scooby-Doo episodes, but still a really cool idea. It's like, no, oh, the ghost ships are real. Oh, the, the people tell stories of them. Those ignorant peasants, like, well, they're not, they're not that ignorant. The Daedalians are kind of, you know, trolling them. So uh, that does explain a lot, <laughs> but I uh, thought that was totally cool. In the Portus Crucis write-up, there is information on, I think they call it ships of the line, but it's basically talking about ships of that time. Now we did get some of that information in, I think, Crusade Lore, the, the second Sorcerer's Crusade book, but this goes into more information about particular types of ships, who uses them, what they're good at, what they're bad at, what waters they sail in, etc. Uh, and this was very useful. And it played right into the section on Sky riggers, which is sky riggers are when you're making a sky rigger for play, you always start with a real world ship and then attach sky rigger equipment to it. And it doesn't give detailed rules about that. Some people may be unhappy about that. I thought it wasn't necessary to have detailed rules, but what it did tell us was different types of sky rigger hookups. Like here's a sky rigger that is small and fast and maneuverable. It's going to have weapons like this. Uh, here's a sky rigger that has balloons on top and it is for going very high up in the air. Uh, here's a sky rigger that has a balloon, but it's not really filled with what you normally see in balloons. It is filled with the void stuff, which was captured when they were sailing out in the void, which is above the sky, which is where the very strange locations are. And there was another sort of a sky rigger that moved through the air, but not so very high up in the air. And so it has different kinds of equipment to make it able to fly. I thought this was, was, was very useful. Up until I read this chapter, I was thinking, okay, when they make sky riggers, there's one kind. It's a ship. It flies. Okay, I, I, I can go with that. But now I have all these different varieties to choose from and knowledge of what they're good and bad at. And so it just makes it more fun for me to put sky riggers in my game as a storyteller. It also tells us that the first sky rigger in the Sorcerer's Crusade setting was created in the late 1450s. So that means for the first 55 years of the Sorcerer's Crusade setting, there were no sky riggers at all. So that was that was kind of interesting. It says that um, Daedalians in the Iberian Peninsula were, were very instrumental in uh, getting sky riggers started. So that's... Uh, feather in the cap for local mages there. That covers chapter two. Sorry to talk so long, but it was just such a great chapter. It is good stuff. Chapter three is entitled The Council of Nine and goes over a number of Council of Nine covenants. The first one listed is Lord Cabot's Grange, and this is a kind of shared work of the Silificati Verbena and aided Euthanatoi. It was a great house that once the traditions formed, Cabot offered his place as a kind of base of operations. Its destiny is up in the air, and that bothers many people. It is located in a secluded part of northern England. It has a great room with many chimneys, a jumble of other rooms as needed. The cabals present are Lord Cabot Circle, who has kind of the vague hope that the place will become a college at some point. Lord Cabot, his brother and father were killed in the fire, views paganism as necessary to bear witness to the great deeds of the church, and uh, has a fairy ambassador present. There is a noted she knight. There is a, a group of Verbena that were invited to join. They are not particularly powerful, and or they do not seem to be particularly powerful and carry themselves as, as servants. And Mother Barnes is the old leader who agreed to join and is slowly passing on her arts. The blazing spear shaft is 
a group dedicated towards the hunt, which is the counter movement against Wingard's march. The hunt needs aid and they provide it. This consists of two Euthanatoi and a, a she knight. John Carpenter is this kind of bloodthirsty and vengeful character who claims to be just an agent of justice, but is more acting as an agent of vengeance. And I thought was a good complicated motive. Uh, believes what they are doing is just karma. And they also mentioned that the uh, John Carpenter believes kind of everything is karma, just the just desserts of and payback of something happened. Celades was the name of a war god that had been expunged, and he is also the name of the uh, the she knight who didn't leave for Arcadia, suggesting that he is quite old. <laughs> they include the note when interacting with you, characters should not feel entirely safe, and is mentioned as representing the hunt. I would have liked a little bit more information, kind of on how fairies are viewed, but I'll take it. This is very much presented as a place that is up in the air. One of the things that happens throughout this book for a number of the places is it kind of gives a future fate. And rather than saying where this could go, it flashes forward to what the site is in the contemporary world. And in almost all cases for all those listed, they are ruins. I don't know if this is a metaphor for like in the fullness of time all is but drost and we are but dust, but in almost no cases it's like, oh, this is a prosperous fishing village or something like that. It's always like, nope, things are great, then everyone ruined it. No magic anymore. The next section we get is Duizatep. We get information on what adept Porthos Fitzedempris looks like. It is mainly a hermetic sham tree in spring that has moved entirely to the spirit realm in response to Dedalian attack. Hermetics must consolidate power before looking outward. It is looking to maintain the ability to recruit across academia and the merchant class. We get a list of recent events. It was attacked in 1448 and is in spring as the Chantry tries to recollect itself. Head of House Regnatus was tried for infernalism and found guilty. I don't know what House Regnatus is. I don't remember it being previously mentioned. And a little bit more information would have been useful. The Great Chancellery was replaced by a chamber of deacons. It was lifted to the Aethiers and in the response left many behind who were just slaughtered by the Order of Reason. And this was suggested as a way that uh, those who knew that this was going to happen could kind of end their political foes. The chamber of deacons became much more powerful, but in exchange they had to accept members of other houses. Additionally, it is now open to other traditions, which they hope to use as a mechanism for both diplomacy and to gain power. It is now in the realm of forces. It is ripped through with lightning and earthquakes with a, a legion of spirits that are the only kind of natural inhabitants. It the place itself is on massive black stone. New towers are rising constantly, albeit slowly. The Hall of Convocation is a place of order and business, and the catacombs go to and from Earth. They are deadly and hidden. There are a lot of cabals present. The, the main one is the Court of the Dragon Ascendant, which seeks mysteries of the Umber Court. The Drushi is an altruistic group that strengthens, uh, seeks to strengthen the Order of Hermes and is attempting to reach out to non-Hermetics to join. The Fraternal Order of Guernicus is trying to take over the Order's Judicium Hermeticum and is tightly tied to House Quasitor. The Children of Pythagoras, this is what Porthos is involved in at the time and is trying to solve old problems in new light. The Lords of the Chamber are the Spy Masters and skilled at Curdemain. We get a number of characters, the cunning Deacon Mavis of Titulus, Mundi Alamantra of Flambeau, who is quite the warrior, uh, killed people during Curdemain, makes disasters where the only solution is to come to him to get aid is dealing kind of with constant plagues of twilight. They make mention of the fact that the word he has chosen as a hermetic is an Enochian one, which other hermetics are like, that's a choice because doing so tends to redound with supernatural significance. Erlang Damask, Bani, uh, and the house listed is Bonnie Assis, which I assume is the same as Bonnie Sages, but throughout they do not use the term Bonnie Sages is simply trying to keep everyone happy. I feel as if this was a character that was a throwback to House Gerbaton, which we do not get in Mage, really. And we get a, a few other characters as well. One of the things that I thought was interesting is they talk about what it is like dealing with Deacon Maeve, who is a skilled mind mage, and several characters knowing that they are or are not compromised by her magic. This feels like this is a representation of what the state of the Order of Hermes is is in this era. At this time, Baldrick LaSalle is trying to make friends. And it is interesting seeing Duizatep 
in spring, as opposed to in the modern era where it's clearly in autumn and possibly winter. We then get Horizon in comparison. We get a timeline, which is largely similar to the timeline we got in Horizon Stronghold of Hope. In 1450, it is founded by 10 primi, two dream speakers and one from each other tradition, and each dedicate a place of power. In 1452, the craze are brought online. In 1453, Orashkar fights back, wishing to claim this area of the Umbra for themselves. The crystal bastions are built around Concordia. Quintessence is brought in and sent out. The flow of Tass attracts yet more unbrewed, and the three tests of faith ensue. These are three events that kind of mark Horizon's early history. Don Horenzio casts a final spell, Urgency, which doubles everyone's speed. Congratulations, he has invented haste. It has about 2,000 mortals on it, which makes sense. It's population has not yet had five centuries to grow. The continent of Posh, which is on the other side of Concordia, is unexplored. Uh, we get some information on the groups that make it up. We have the Order of Sanguinity, which just has a kind of hatred for the Order of Reason, Horizon Guard, which are 13 members that defend the realm, and the Builders of the Dream, who just kind of want to finish the place. Another thing that is kind of notable here is we get a snapshot of the council. Murshid leading the Batini is listed as being a leader but not representative and is reporting back to the shady masters of the Ali Batin, Wujin of the Akashiana. Man, that's a quality mustache he has. We get information on Chalak, the Paramaguru of the Euthanatoi, uh, so an archmaster. We get more information about the Mercy Schism, the idea that the Celestial Chorus has been expelled from mortal churches and believe strongly that contact with other traditions will keep it current. Star of Eagles and Nyoba in the first book, were like, why are we presenting Rebuses? Looks like we got another Rebus here. Baldric LaSalle is a Ergaltarian hermetic who finds it easier to deal with other mages than other hermetics. Believes strongly in the dream of Horizon. Shazar of the Seers, who uses exotic smokes and has three familiars. That's like a wizard that has like two wands. That's just kind of cool. We have Louis Estes, the arrogant but discreet Primus of the Silificati. And we got Nightshade of the Verbena. And to fulfill the quota of a Verbena character being presented just with boobs out, we got that box checked. We get a little bit of information about some of the subterfuge that has marked the place, like Mariano Rossini, who led in the technocrats, thinking Valorin was being compromised by the pagans, but were successfully fended off. And again, this is a useful snapshot. I like the fact that we get information on who the Prime Eye are. Uh, one of my biggest criticisms of M20 is we just don't know who they are. They are characters that are powerful, have their own agenda, but are often distant. So I like that combination of attributes as it makes it something easy that can can be a powerful mover and shaker within your chronicle, but without entirely dominating it. They are presented as, as people, their agendas are straightforward, and it was just kind of nice to read up on them. At the same time, both of these entries felt both necessary and wasted, in that we already have a lot of contemporary information on both of these uh, chantries in terms of Duizatep and Horizon. I can see why they kind of felt necessary to list it, but at the same time, I would have liked new other stuff, but this book was great and is jam-packed with stuff, so I get it. You, you kind of have to pick. But what did you think about Chapter 3, Adam? Uh, well, actually, Chapter 3 was, was disappointing to me. Um, I, I thought there was uh, too much from uh, past mage books here, uh, too little that was new. Sorcerer's to say it explains to us that at this uh, era, uh, mages have created very few horizon realms. So I was expecting to get some covenants of the traditions on earth. We only get three listings in this chapter, which was, you know, we had five in chapter two for the order of reason. But of those three, only one is a covenant on earth. And two of them are horizon realms. And not only that, they are horizon realms that have been covered in the past. Just thinking as a storyteller myself, it's really Really pretty simple for me to go back to the past write-up of modern day Doisetep and Horizon Chantry and to you know extrapolate what would this look like in the Renaissance era. You know, especially with the uh, Horizon Chantry being so new. It's just not hard for me to figure that one out. And so when I read these two Horizon Realms descriptions in this chapter, it's like yeah, there's a lot of repeated information here. It's like, yeah, I, I know the author went back and, and read those old books. I like them too, but why are you repeating so much? The Horizon Chantry write-up basically said, uh, not much is going on here. There's a lot of empty space. You could do anything you want here. It's like, yeah, I, I know that, but a couple of pages of description to tell me that is, is quite unnecessary. What I appreciated about the chapter two was it showed how the Order of Reason is fighting against 
the Council of Nine, which is something the Sorcerer's Crusade core book talks about. We see Rowan Castle. This is where they keep watch on the region and they send out mages on horseback to go fight tradition mages and enforce their will. So I really, really wanted to see a covenant of the traditions on the Italian peninsula that is doing something against the order of reason, whether it's academic or you know practical nuts and bolts uh, day-to-day conflict. E- either way, I-, I would have liked to have seen something. How is the Council of Nine reacting to the order of reason which is throwing its weight around uh, in-, in Western Europe and in this era? It just wasn't here. Lord Cabot's Grange has local color, but uh, reading through it, it was I gotta say, it's actually kind of dull. I mean, I can see how there would be a covenant like that at that time. It's just there's not a lot of motivation for me to really put this in my game. As an Order of Hermes fan, what disappointed me was the Book of Chantries in 1993, it said that at that time, Doisetep is in winter. It's riddled with intrigue. Boy, it was so good in the past. So I I turned to this Castles and Covenants book. I look at the Renaissance era write-up, and it's it's like, it's the same thing. It, It seems to be in winter. I mean, I don't think it really is, but it sure reads that way. It's riddled with intrigue. The mages is like mind controlling uh, the other uh, top leaders in there and basically running the show without admitting it. And I don't know, it, it's just like uh, too much modern Doisetep wedged into the Renaissance era. It should be, it should feel and operate more differently. I noticed that there is a mention of a hermetic mage called Adeptus Adamantios. J- just that, no illustration, no details, just the name. And I gotta say, that is my new mage fan name. Ne- next time we record an episode, I want to be called Adeptus Adamantios. It takes more time to say, but trust me, it's worth it. Um, I thought it was odd that there were a number of awakened Mercer House uh, Hermetics in the Doisetep description. I guess that's fine. It's not really a criticism I can make. It's just that past books and also uh, Ars Magica books, which had um, House Mercer in the Order of Hermes, uh, describes that at the in the time of the Middle Ages and also the Renaissance, communication is very difficult. It takes time to send messengers between uh, towns and cities. And so if you have some good messengers, you'd better treat them well so they don't quit and you have to you know find more and train them up and trust them again when you don't know them very well. So the the majority or maybe even all of the members of House Mercer were not wizards. They were not mages. Uh, they were just normal people who were very good messengers. And they were honored by you know being declared House Mercer to make them feel special, to make them not want to go work for someone else. And so here reading through this chapter, it's like there's a whole bunch of awakened Mercer mages. And so okay, it's like, that's different. I, I guess you can do that. It just struck me as odd. More of a general statement for the book. But uh, when I read through these chapters, there's a lot of attention given to the NPCs that are at these locations. This was especially true of, of this chapter three. There's so much information on the mages that are here. And what I want is an interesting place because I'm going to put my own NPCs there anyways. So I, I like to see more description of the place and what makes it interesting. And then, yeah, also put some NPCs in that, that give us some, some story ideas. But uh, this, lean, this chapter leaned really heavy on the NPCs and not so much on the location. So that uh, made it a little disappointing to me. But uh, I guess we can take a look at chapter four, and I'm going to help with the walkthrough for that. The Lickspittal players are thespians and musicians who travel back and forth across Europe in three horse-pulled wagons. They are a mix of different mages and their unawakened companions. They have very little resources or influence, but great freedom. They are well-positioned to hear the latest news and gossip. The leader is a celestial chorister, but he is not well-connected to other members of his tradition, which is fitting because, again, Chapter 4 is talking about independent covenants. They're not in the Order of Reason and not in the Council of Nine. Uh, The second one we get is Tower Nocturna, and this is a uh, building in in Florence on the Italian peninsula. They hire out their services as assassins and spies to both sleepers and mages. Given the sort of mages they recruit, it isn't a surprise there is an uneasy peace in the covenant as some plan to seize power for themselves. And when assassins seize power, people die. This covenant holds much information on the doings of both mages and the nobility in Italian cities. They are ready to be hired by your players. What could possibly go wrong? And that's really the two locations of Chapter 4, both uh, independent covenants. So, Terry, what did you think of these? You're skipping the third location that was given. The Magnus, our boat coven, 
which gets about eight words on page 120. It is two paragraphs. Oh, that's and right. That. I did skip that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh, man. My mistake. It yeah, it just says, literally there's a boat. Sentences. <laughs> yeah, there's a boat. There's a few mages on it. Okay, moving on. And yeah, that's, exactly. I forgot about it. <laughs> you're right. You will see a coven containing on a boat. Moving on. Uh, I found the Lickspittle players to be absolutely infuriating. They are listed as summering in, in Britain and wintering in the Mediterranean. How Anne is kind of the uh, ingenue character that people are supposed to be like, oh, as she's trying to figure out what she wants to do with her life. She is shown as being skilled at calming horses, and that is part of her role. But we learn in the Sorcerer's Crusade core rulebook that that is trivial in that it is listed as difficulty three and can be done reflex reflexively. Um, and you need to bring more to the party if that's why we're going to include you. Very much looks like a Disney character. I'm waiting at any moment for her character to start singing, I'm wishing, which makes me wish that every character in here also got that opportunity. Like, I really want to see Paramount. Magulu Guru Chalik of the Euthanatoi have one, which would be awesome, and him just going, I'm wishing, and talking about the future of Horizon. This group is one of those cases where it's like, yeah, you have a lot of mages. They could change the world. What are they doing? Oh, slowly performing mediocre plays across Europe. Nice. This reminds me of that effing flower shop in the Verbena Revised book, where it's like the three of you combined could kill Vormas. What are you doing? Operating a flower shop. Really, really great that you've brought that level to the Ascension War. I find it interesting that in this section and the previous ones, not everything was done by Lobenstein, especially if a character was supposed to be pretty. I believe that all characters in Mage have the right to be portrayed as a leprotic waxen tombstone. I like the section on the Tower Nocturnus, where it's a mortal facing group, which is kind of interesting. And it makes mention that the mage upon awakening quickly realized that he could use his powers to kill people. I'm like, yep, pretty sure every mage throughout all of time has immediately realized that upon awakening. <laughs> Being like, oh, this is great. I have magic powers. Oh, man, all those people I wanted to kill. This seems so much easier now. We also get one of the characters who is a, a woman of the night, to be polite, that and then there's the section that says a seer of Kronos became a frequent visitor to Polly's room. She despised him too, for she, for he still seemed the same as the countless other men that she had been there. But he taught her how to uh, find pleasure in everything, which just sounds like a descriptor of he wasn't that great in bed, but he taught her how to deal with that. And that was kind of the only interpretation that I could leave that section with. Um, <laughs> this section was fine. I was kind of hoping we'd get a neutral mover and shaker or something like that, or a very powerful disparate craft of some sort um, a disparate covenant of some sort and we just didn't get any <sighs> again it's one of those things where it is hard to yell at a book who provides a lot of good stuff for not providing the particular kind of good stuff that you wanted uh, what did you feel as a reader about the entries in chapter four adam well, I think uh, they were trying to show how independent covenants do not have as much power and influence as the two big groups, the Order of Reason and the Council of Nine. And I, I think they did a good job of that. I think the Lickspittle players, although, to be honest, not my favorite, I think it does do a good job of providing an example of the sort of covenant a lot of players out there of Sorcerer Crusade might actually like to join. It, it, there's a lot of travel. There's a lot of freedom. Uh, I, I agree. Cross the uh, what is it the English Channel back in those days uh, once or twice a year for a less wealthy group like like the Lickspittal players is is stretching things a little too far but you know putting that aside uh, this is a group that travels around a lot they get a lot of gossip I can see how uh, beginner players of Sorcerer's Crusade could really enjoy that hey we've got all this great information we can move around we can cut loose and have some fun and be hams and uh, once we get a better idea of what we really want to do we can just quit the group and it's they won't care. If, if you quit this group, they don't come after you. It's like, okay, bye. See you later. So it was useful in that sense. Tower Nocturna, I thought, was a lot of fun because um, it just has so many possibilities, whether the players are joining it or the players interact with it. Uh, and they can interact with it the same way, no matter which mage faction they belong to. This is a, a group of uh, spies, ladies of the night, and assassins. 
and you know specialty thieves. They can um, steal very important things from very well guarded places because mages are more capable than sleepers. And so any faction of mages might hire them or come into conflict with them. You could move this tower to any large city in Western Europe and it could work pretty well. It just has so many possibilities that as a storyteller, it's so easy to just toss it into my games, even if it's not the central story. So uh, I thought that was, was well done. I'm ready to hear about chapter five. Chapter five, other places of note. And we get the Benedictine Monastery of St. Gregory, which is essentially a Mayra Chantry of mad monks. We kind of had a, a leader of the monastery who saw damnation and repentance everywhere. And under his harsh stricture, two fellows awakened and immediately fell into quiet. This should have been listed as the Monastery of St. Plot Device. And it just had, uh, it talks about how that there are passageways that, that pop up as are needed, that people undergo horrendous torments, that death is seemingly lurking around every corner, but miraculously people always survive either due to uh, sudden coincidences or things not being quite as bad as necessary, and that the characters present are in a state of perpetual torment, going back and forth between being tormentor and tormentee. It is in the French Alps, so you know it is menacing. It is cut off kind of from the surrounding area by a, a great storm and earthquake and it is exactly kind of what you would expect a marauder chantry to look like and it answered the question of so what would a sh uh, marauder chantry look like the next one is the isle of Coringist, which is a led by a mage who very much feels that the formation of the traditions is just going to hasten and make more violent the opposition to the order of reason, that it's kind of one of those things where force meets force, that both the Dedalians and the council are highly prone to hubris. The island is fertile and provides most of what it needs. It also has a node, tasses in the form of beach sand. One of the recurring ideas within this book is it gives us very interesting sources of tasks. It seems to have the idea that all nodes produce it, or almost all do, but in many cases, the things depicted as being the source of tasks that come from a cray, I thought were, were imaginative. In this case, it's it's just plain beat sand, but it takes uh, hours of meditation and focus, and seemingly only the person in charge of the area has the ability to find it. It hosts a dozen independent or disparate mages. If you're doing something dangerous, you may be asked to go to one of the smaller islands off the coast of the island, and I would have loved if this got the level of write-up of Horizon or do as a tap. This could be something that single-handedly expanded the presence of the disparates within this book. I thought both of these were great and imaginative, and I'm glad they're here. And my only criticism is I wish I got a little bit more. Chapter five was pretty short. What did you think about it, Adam? You hit the nail right on the head. Chapter five was very short. The, the two, there were two locations. Uh, the descriptions for both were quite short Indeed, they were both interesting, but such brief write-ups that it's it's more like suggestions than locations. But uh, the Monastery of St. Gregory is I interesting. I see it as a place that could be a designated marauder covenant. Uh, I also see it as a strange supernatural occurrence that is likely to soon attract a few marauders, but may not have attracted them yet. And uh, there's some you know, strange effect in the place that is making people go insane or behave as if they were partially insane. And I like the idea, but it's so vague that it's hard for storytellers, especially new storytellers for Sorcerer's Crusade, to, to run with this ball. Because you read about it, it's like, oh, okay, so that sounds interesting, but can I have some systems? Like, what do you roll against to show that it's happening, or what do you roll to resist it, or... or what stats on a character sheet make me aware of if a character is more or less likely to fall under the effect? Because, of course, you know, you're know you going to have your players go there and investigate what's going on here. It's like, okay, do they immediately become insane and, and they're done and they might write up new characters? Or do they you know, roll against this? Or which of them are more likely to have a problem with this? I mean, give me some systems. Give me some way to implement this great idea that you have for a very unusual place. And so, yeah, great idea, but poor implementation. The island that Terry mentioned, I, I think I'm, I'm going to probably butcher this, the, the Corrigus uh, Covenant on this island in the Mediterranean. 
Uh, I thought that was a really good idea. I think it belonged in chapter four because it's an independent covenant, but putting that aside for a moment, I really do like the idea. It's it's uh, peaceful. It, it wants to keep to itself, but it's not isolationist. If, if mages of other groups are going to come through and just you know rest here and, and get some fresh water or maybe store you know pay them to, to store some stuff for them or get you know update their charts so they can reach their destination successfully the Koragus covenant is, is open to this and so it makes it very nice to be able to work them into another chronicle even if they're not the focus of that chronicle it's an interesting place to stop off and see that oh there's there's more going on in the world than just uh, tradition mages and uh, convention mages duking it out there's other things happening on the side that might get hurt by this conflict if, if they're not protected so I really like the, the Corrigus Covenant, but yeah, like Terry said, it would have been so much more fun to give it more word count so that we could get uh, you know some more details of you know, who's there, what secrets are they are they hoping that visitors don't find, what are give me something more solid about what really are their plans for the future. If they were to be if they were to get a really good pal who gave them tons of resources, what would they do with all of those resources? I, I don't have a real clear sense from this write up, and so that makes it disappointing for me. But yeah, it's it's a cool idea. What is here? I would love to use turning to. Uh, discussing the book in general. Uh, Terry, what were your thoughts on this book? This book was great. This book quite simply shows what a number of people who seemingly have a lot of ideas and are kind of fresh views on the line can do. The names listed on the front, we don't see a lot of other books listed to them. And I find it interesting that in trying to find out, hey, what else did these authors do? One of them was working on the canceled book, Hosts of Heaven, which was an interface of reason and magic in and and religion for Mage Sorcerer's Crusade. It was supposed to come out in, I think, July of 2001 and was uh, canceled. It was also supposed to cover kind of the Middle East, Levantine, West Asia region, and we never got that. The information presented here is a slight break from what we've gotten before, like some of the dates are a little bit off. Some of the understandings of what an Archmaster does or of how Quintessence works or something feels a little bit different than what I feel we had gotten in the line before. But Honestly, that's fine to me. This book is so crammed full of characters and events that Castles and Covenants, even if you don't need that portion of it, I still think it is a great book full of interesting NPCs. I would have loved stat blocks in some of these cases, though. I am new to Sorcerer's Crusade, and while in something like Revised, I would be perfectly fine not having character blocks. Just at least give me like spheres and maybe in a retail level or something like that. I really would have liked some information there. The different authors' voices come through in different places. The Kraken House write-up had two and a half pages of backstory that was a particular legend, and that just felt like a lot. So it is very spacious in some cases and very tight in others. Uh, this is exceptional uh, stuff, and I only wish we had gotten more of it. It real ha it has a very strong Ars Magica feel to it, but otherwise, I I thought it was great. I, I would have liked some mechanics, though, some information on how Skyriggers worked, and it certainly left me uh, wanting more, and I hope future books like Artisan's Handbook and The Order of Reason can fill that in. What did you think, Adam? I really liked the book. Uh, back in uh, first edition for Mage, I really liked the Book of Chantries, and this book is not just like that, but uh, there, there are a few... Uh, elements from that that get worked into this book. And so I, I just really enjoyed that. This is as close as I'm going to get to a second Book of Chantry for any edition of Mage. And I'm glad to get it. Uh, I like the book. Um, I think it would be nice to see fans develop uh, some kind of rules for downtime activities for covenants for Sorcerer's Crusade, uh, things like gaining allies, um, developing agriculture, improving defenses, something like that. Because I think when players are in a covenant, I think it would be a lot of fun to cover some downtime activities between the stories or the active game sessions. I think it'd be some, I don't know, some rough system where you could give each player five or 10 points and say, what do you want to spend these points on developing? And maybe a, a table you could roll against or, or some suggestions on, on how to roll a die and see, oh yeah, you did it. Or uh, you did it, but there's this problem. Or you failed and now you have this additional problem. I mean, something like that. I, I think it would make covenants more fun to have something like this. I, I'm a big fan of the, the fantasy role-playing games in the current uh, OSR space, and uh, there are a lot of books published both by gaming companies and by individuals that have a lot of material on downtime activities for individuals and, and groups of individuals in those games, and something like that for Star Wars is Crusade, I think would be a lot of fun. I would say in the Sorcerer's Crusade era, Horizon Realms are not as well understood by mages as they are in, in later eras. I think 
it would be interesting to say that many mages uh, assume they are true umbral realms and not know that they fall apart if their craze on Earth are disconnected. Uh, and so I think that would also explain why uh, Horizon Realms in this period are not targeted by rival uh, mage factions so much. It's, it's, there's just not a very good understanding of the difference between a Horizon Realm and an Umbral Realm and the need that Horizon Realms have on their supplying craze. And you know, of course, some mages are going to know this because, of course, mages are creating Horizon Realms. But... I would reiterate that not many mages are creating Horizon Realms at this point, and a lot of their buddies that they bring into the Horizon Realm to live with them are not going to understand the, the details very well. And so I think that's another way to make Sorcerer's Crusade more uh, unique from the modern era of mage. I would really like period-appropriate covenant creation rules. I may be in a very small minority of mage fans in that, but I would have loved them to look at the castle, or what, what is it, uh, Chantry creation system from the first book of Chantries and say, okay, let's, let's do something a little updated, uh, period appropriate, put it into this book. That would have made me very happy, but I can't say that's a criticism because I'm probably one of very few fans that actually wants to have that. Most storytellers are going to say, look, here, here is a covenant that I've got in this setting. You can join it or not. Here, here's a couple of different ones. Pick one you want to join if you want to be in a covenant. And, and that's fine. That's a perfectly legitimate way to run the game. I think chapter one and the section on the Portus Crucis uh, write-up called Ships of the Line, both of these together make this a valuable supplement for storytellers. I would uh, say if, if someone is prepping to run a chronicle in Sorcerer's Crusade, I would say go back and reread uh, Crusade lore and from Castles and Covenants, read chapter one and the ships of the line right up under uh, chapter two. And it's going to help you to run your games. Great idea, good use of time, and won't really take that long to read. Uh, certainly a lot less time than rereading the core book for Sorcerer's Crusade. So that sums up my thoughts on the book. Very good book. Uh, very glad that we have this for Sorcerer's Crusade. I think it gives us more than just castles and covenants. I think it gives a lot of other great suggestions and, and ideas and just storyteller information. So don't miss this one. So uh, were there uh, any uh, quotes that stand out in this book, Jerry? Yeah, the actually kind of the opening line of chapter one of without the folk who build it, garrison it, and conspire to batter down its walls, a castle is simply an artfully arranged pile of rocks, which I thought was reasonable. As always, a fan of the Thanatoi, the quote regarding Paramaguru Chalik, I enjoyed. The serenity of death resonates homogeneously throughout everything in your proximity. I don't know if this was a diss. I don't know if this was a compliment, but to say the death resonates homogeneously, I think is a uh, interesting choice of words. What are we reading next, Adam? Next up, we've got the Artisan's Handbook. I have not read that. Uh, apparently, it's going to focus on the, the artisans of uh, the Order of Reason, but perhaps other mages that also use those methods. It's not a terribly long book, but uh, I, I hope it gives us some, some great ideas and great suggestions there. We'll have to see. I, I heard it talks about guilds, but I, I can't think of any names of guilds, so uh, hopefully they can make that interesting. Yeah. But uh, if you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. You can subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a positive review for us, it makes us more visible in their online searches when they're looking for something new to listen to. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see the complete show notes that we provide for you. We have a YouTube channel now where you can find our episodes. There's a link in the show notes, but you can also search YouTube for Mage the Podcast, all lowercase. Don't sweat the colon. You will find us. This episode was assisted greatly by our executive producers. Terry, can you share the names of our executive producers? I would be glad to. Thank you to Oracle Buck Gregory, Oracle Christopher Phillips, Oracle Josh Hillerup, Oracle Jay Widener, Oracle Mikhail, and Oracle the Crew of Erebus. Additionally, thank you to Alex, Alexia, Andrews S., Andrew Edelstein, Anon, Badurfi, Birdo, Blaze Hibbert, Blake Ryan, Boo, Boogers to the Six, Brad the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris B., Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scrimder, Dan Svensson, David Roy, Derek Osborne, Derek Semsek, Fraggle Rock, Gar George Laura, Guy Conan Stewart, Ia Bolt, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, Jason W. Briggs, Jeff Brin, John Magnuson, Julian Andes, Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Chris Kinner, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Proyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Morgan Aran, Nathan Weaver, Nibero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick McNamara, Patrick Mulder, Puka G, Rachel Grace, Ralph Scheinhammer, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Rob A. Tryon Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, Sean Gallagher, Thrice Great, William Connolly, William Martin, and Zach Rules. Thank you for your support. If you would like to become an executive producer for Mage the Podcast, it would help us to keep producing episodes like this one. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks everyone for listening, and until next time, truth until paradox, baby. 
Go change reality. Bye.